Welcome to Operation Market Garden, Tool Time Style. For those of you who are new to my channel, thank you for dropping in. For those of you who have been here before, you'll probably notice that this video has absolutely nothing to do with fixing up your old car or my old pieces of junk. So this is a hobby of mine, military history. And this is the first in a series of videos that I would like to uh, engage people on various topics related to military history. Before starting, I'd kind of like to throw a little bit of love uh, toward a couple of the guys that I watch uh, on YouTube uh, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, I find their work to be um, interesting, entertaining, and useful. So let's take a quick look at uh, the source of today's discussion. I'm actually going to be talking about one of um, the uh, videos and the assertions that uh, you'll find over here on Tick History, the, uh, the, the Imperator Knight, a guy by the name of Lewis. Uh, I don't know his last name. But I do know that um, he puts in a lot of work uh, in, into his videos. If you take a look down here, there's a whole slew of detailed um, videos. And in particular, we're going to focus on Market Garden that has kind of evolved over the years for him. He's done some, some really good work here. Um, another one I've probably referenced today real quickly is uh, The Chieftain. I uh, really like his videos. He uh, does a real good job of explaining uh, different battles, different equipment, uh, that sort of thing. Um, just find him to be quite, um, quite informative. And for those of you who are kind of interested in um, the Ukraine war and a little bit more uh, detail, um, I really like this guy, Perun, Perun. I don't know what his name is. His real name is, but um, he does some really thorough research, um, comes to some reasonable conclusions. You know, he, he's not trying to force you to believe his uh, point of view. Uh, but lays out some really good information for you that, that helps you frame uh, the, the Ukraine conflict that are going on. So these are some of the guys who um, sort of have inspired me. And, you know, up until this point, uh, you know, I haven't done any videos. At least not any videos in the military history, uh, current affairs, that sort of uh, realm. So... These are guys that I kind of look up to, uh, among others, um, in part because of the thoroughness that, of which they uh, do their research, and um, you know the conclusions they draw. I think are are um, well thought out. Whether you agree with them or not, they're well thought out and uh, generally well documented. So today I'm going to be making my first attempt uh, to engage. Uh, the discussion and, you know, hopefully start some new discussions uh, of my own with, uh, with the viewers here um, regarding Operation Market Garden. Um, I've got the links on the board and I'll make sure that they're included down in the um, description. Um, the, the, the gist of, of his series is one of the first video up there is a very detailed uh, sort of step-by-step -step chronological uh, thing with the map shows you what's going on. And for those of you who uh, don't have a lot of uh, familiarity with Operation Market Garden, it's an excellent, um, you know, excellent review. Um, some of his subsequent stuff, he gets into uh, kind of trying to analyze why the operation failed. I mean, for those of you who are familiar with it, you know, you send in three airborne divisions deep, 30 Corps, the British 30 Corps was supposed to roll up this carpet and grab the bridge across the Rhine, and everything was going to be wonderful, kumbaya, we were going to win the war by Christmas, right? At least that's what the, uh, the movie A Bridge Too Far nar opening narrative would have you believe. Um, one of the key takeaways from Tick's review is to more or less isolate what uh, he views as the critical event, um, the nine, nine mega bridge uh, operation and the decisions around it and the effects that it has on the overall operation. 
and he draws some conclusions. And we'll talk about them in a minute. And um, then he does a book review. And then there at the bottom, I've included um, uh, a reference to his Need a Break uh, video. And the reason I include that link is because uh, not long ago, a couple months ago, uh, he was really kind of down in the dumps. And uh, he was uh, he was sort of beating his head against the wall, trying to, um, you know, inform and educate and engage people whose minds were already made up, basically. And he was just struggling. He was like, what do I have to do to convince these people? And I want to say that he was focused on the uh, progressives and socialists and leftists um, in his in his frustration but no matter how many citations he made you know he was he was really struggling and you know I've watched him watch a lot of his videos over the years and you know it's sort of the frustration level has built up and uh, I, I, I kind of empathize with him because in this one time where I reach out to engage him on a topic um, I've been involved in a series of threads, uh, you know, a thread with a series of um, different uh, folks on, on the conversation. And you just, you know, you just run into this, um, I, I'm here to prove a point kind of people, right? The, and so uh, you can really relate to, uh, you know, it's like, how, how do we have an open, you know, meaningful discussion where we exchange views and we learn from each other? And you know, we analyze what happened, uh, why did it happen, what was the information around the decisions that made it happen, uh, what were the consequences. And then, you know, to me, sort of the blame game is sort of the last step. Okay, once you've laid out all the consequences, okay, well, who, who actually made that decision? Then, of course, they or, you know, whoever was a part of that, uh, you know, gets the blame or the glory, whichever. Uh, so as I watched this video, uh, on or a series of videos on on a bridge too far and basically Operation Market Garden, uh, he came to some interesting conclusions, and I'll talk about you know what I thought, and then what unfolded from there, which is the impetus behind me um, doing this video. Now I'm gonna take my ugly mug off here, and uh, yeah, I got the Army T-shirt, you know, got you know been there, got the T-shirt kind of thing. Um, I'm not going to get into my resume too much, except I'll just give you a little, just a little highlight. You know, I started off as a private, ended up as a full colonel, uh, did a fair number of years in National Guard, had multiple deployments on active duty, um, you know, uh, tours. Uh, went, I've done some peacekeeping, some combat operations, some advising um, at all various different ranks. Um, and so as we look at this, I approached, I approached this discussion of Operation Market Garden from someone with a fair amount of um, operational experience. I was an operations officer at various levels, and I, I'm interested personally in the kinds of things that lead to good decisions and bad decisions. And I think this is important in the modern age, because if you look at, you know, whether it's Desert Storm or Afghanistan or Iraq or the new um, environment with Ukraine and, and NATO, uh, you know, the coalition's uh, mentality. Uh, understanding coalition operations, especially, you know, multi-echelon coalition operations is, to me, is an important thing. Now, granted, I'm retired, so, uh, you know, it's not like I'm going to make a lot of difference, but I like to have the discussion to understand how we can do better, how we can make better decisions, recognize better options, uh, work together, you know, two, two people separated by a, you know, a similar la common language, that kind of thing. So that's a little bit about where I come from. I do have a degree in military history, but um, from, the, from the perspective of, of this, um, you know, from the perspective of a, a video blogger, whatever you want to call it, um, and a historian, I want to make sure that you, you sort of understand that I come at this as sort of a well-informed uh, enthusiast. Um, I don't have the time or probably even the inclination to do the level of detail of, of research that uh, Lewis does. And so I want to give full faith and credit to these other guys who are making a living doing this 
um, and you know kudos to everything that they're they're doing I got nothing but good things to say about them okay with that said let's go ahead and kind of uh, uh, talk about this series uh, basically tick has a review and he where he talks about um, in particular the operations on the bridge at the bridges around Nijmegen and the decisions that General Gavin makes and uh, goes from there and you know he basically blames Gavin and to a large degree I agree um, but with anything uh, there are certain caveats to that and uh, there's also some other considerations um, he talks about the bad plan badly executed narrative that uh, most of us are sort of familiar with from Cornelius Ryan and you know he thinks that that's uh, at least my impression is he thinks that is a, a faulty or outdated narrative so if I was gonna kind of start this it's like what is tick uh, you know saying and then I'm gonna tell you what I said and then we're going to talk about the impetus of this video um, and how engaging in you know any kind of meaning meaningful dialogue is sometimes um, <laughs> hampered by people's biases and agendas and I you know I probably I, I have my own biases and agendas I'm not saying I'm innocent of this um, but there you know it's, it's sometimes very difficult to have conversations especially when you're doing one post every 12 hours you know if you're talking with someone on the other side of the world so let's take a look at what tick asserts in his in these series of videos of course the one video he just outlines the main operation um, but he ducked he talks about general gavin's blame factor and in terms of the decision to deprioritize the uh, immediate selection of the nijmegen bridges on day one in favor of securing the, the Grisby hikes. So this is a scenario where um, the 82nd Airborne has a you know a reported threat to the east, and rather than go grab the bridge, they set up defensive positions on Grisby Heights, and then they missed the opportunity to grab the bridge. And he talks about uh, you know the the relatively speaking the non-existent threat that is in the Reichswald and uh, that the delay of uh, the capturing the bridges early on day one is why 30 Corps was late to Arnhem. Um, another one of his general themes is that 30 Corps was not slow as, as depicted in the movie A Bridge Too Far and uh, Cornelius Ryan, Ryan, Ryan's book. Um, I think he makes some really good points here. The delay at the Somme Bridge were you know, basically made up by the time they got to Nijmegen. And uh, the, the, the delay really occurs at Nijmegen Bridge, okay? And 30 Corps was there waiting. So, you know, it, of course, that leads to the view that this is all the 82nd Airborne's fault. Um, they didn't get the bridge. So now there's this delay. Uh, 30 Corps wasn't slow. At least, you know, he and I agree on that. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little more later. Uh, and then the last sort of takeaway that I get from him is that, you know, the bad plan, badly executed narrative is outdated, um, that it's mainly intended to shift the blame on the Monty and 30 Corps, which I think he's accurately making that assessment. Um, I think there is some of that involved, that the narrative is intentionally, uh, you know, shielding U.S. mistakes and failures. And except for the Nijmegen decision, the plan, the plan was otherwise sound. So this is where we're going to start to disagree a little bit. Um, I, I tend to agree with him on the first two points, that the narrative does mask the American uh, contributions to failure. Um, but the, the plan was not sound. Um, so we'll talk about, or at least not in my opinion. So with that said, let's kind of take a look at what, you know, what did I think? All right. And what started me down the road of producing this general video? Um, at one point in, in the conversation, I posted my thread out to him and I posted a couple of comments and there was an exchange in which people were discussing the Reichswald uh, threat, the just to the east of the 82nd Airborne. There was this 
this supposed tank force. And Tick gets into a, a point of one of his uh, videos about the this claim that there that Gavin makes that there was a thousand tanks sitting over there in the Reichswald. And it's not entirely clear where that narrative comes from, uh, the thousand tank myth uh, it comes from. But, you know, my, my assertion in largely agreeing with um, Lewis on his, on his uh, blame game, if you will, is, you know, look, if you have a thousand tanks, when you, when you read Gavin's uh, statements. When you read that Gavin changed, acknowledges that himself that he changed the priorities and got Browning to agree to changing priorities. When you read all these things together, uh, what you find is that Gavin made a decision to deprioritize the bridges in favor of securing the Grisbeek Heights and he, he got Browning to agree for it, you know, to go along with it. And so collectively, in, you know, in my view, that if you're looking for a single point failure, that's where the blame lies is with these two guys. Um, but as with anything, there is a caveat. So I'm going to address sort of the main themes that went through my commentary um, with various folks over several days and weeks. You know, the first thing is it was a bad plan and it was badly executed. It's not an outdated narrative. The problem is that just because it was a bad plan doesn't mean it wouldn't work. Uh, there's a, you know, an axiom of war, a bad plan, boldly executed is better than a good plan that's never executed or something to that effect. But the key phrase is bad plan, boldly executed. Um, the problem was this was a bad plan badly executed and uh, you know no matter how much you do you got to have some degree of functionality in that boldness um, so the narrative is not wrong the shifting of the blame onto 30 core which is the second point and saying that they were slow is not really fair to, to be honest uh, at least not in my view um, when you look at how quickly they advanced uh, it just doesn't really hold up to muster um, but once again there were operational mistakes within 30 core and i'm not talking about the you know not getting the boats forward you know for the amphibious operation or not building the bailey bridge fast enough at, at the son bridge and there were other mistakes that we'll talk about in a few minutes that impacted the success. And it's like, so it wasn't a question of being slow as so much as the plan uh, causes the next thing, which is causes Gavin and Horrocks, um, excuse me, Gavin and Browning to make the decision to deprioritize the bridge in favor of the Grisbeek High Security. You know, basically, they have to choose between securing the bridges. They don't have enough, Gavin doesn't have the resources to capture all of the objectives immediately. And so he decides that he's going to um, secure the, the, the heights, basically protect his flank, and then he'll go after the bridge. So you'll notice above, I say the blame in purple, it says solely, right? The blame is solely on these guys. And down here at the bottom, I'm going to slightly amend that to be significantly to blame. Um, the distinction will be in pre-operational planning versus post, you know, uh, post H hour execution. Gavin's mistake of prioritizing the the heights is the last straw in a in a long string of bad decisions. Any one of those decisions before we get to this point. Uh, might have changed the entire dynamic of the 82nd Airborne Operations decision to prioritize the heights. So it is, while he is, when, when it gets down to actual execution and the troops are, you know, boots are on the ground, um, it becomes the sole, you know, mistake, if you will, that, that 
that matters. But it's a mistake that only manifests itself after layers of mistake upon mistake upon mistake. So it's sort of, the, like I say, the last draw. Um, and one of the last themes that I have is in my narratives or my commentary is uh, Montgomery shares some culpability. And those, there are, uh, I bring this up because there are people out there who like try and exonerate one side or the other. And there's a couple, the, one of these guys is just like, oh, Montgomery walks on water, you know, blah, blah, blah. But this is one of those examples where no one's narrative is, is completely accurate. You know, Montgomery has some culpability, but he is not the sole blame of failure, at least not from my point of view. And remember, I'm an American, okay? And a lot of, a lot of this commentary, whether there's blame that's directed at Montgomery or someone else, is nationalistic in nature. And this kind of goes back to the point that I, I made earlier about... Um, coalition operations, right? Multi-echelon coalition operations. I really believe that we need to understand that, that America, Europe, Britain, Canada, Australia, the Kiwis, in particular Japanese, uh, we need to understand coalition operations because we live in a very dangerous time. I think almost as dangerous as uh, World War II and of course, with the nuclear aspects of it, obviously potentially more dangerous. So I think it's very important we understand this. And when we get into the blame game, we tend to lose track of uh, you know reality. If you, the blame should be the last thing we discuss. So that's my commentary. And in the course of this, I had some conversations with a whole series of guys. The first guy to engage me was a Yank. Um, his name is Big Woody, and to be honest, he's one of these guys that Montgomery's to blame for everything, right? And whatever Montgomery didn't screw up, Browning, Horrocks, and uh, Urquhart were responsible for, and Gavin and the 82nd were heroic dudes. And it's like, okay, um, you know, he and I went back and forth. Uh, I found uh, Big Woody's commentary to be um, helpful. You know, he had quite a few um, pieces of information that, you know, I hadn't read to hadn't read about things like that um but you know, i think that he fails to appreciate um you know at least in my opinion some of the um constraints that the british were operating under and uh, and doesn't seem to acknowledge that americans contributed to anything to uh, the failure um you know Everyone's entitled to their opinion. We went back and forth. And at some point, you know, that conversation kind of died out. Uh, th there was some dialogue. Uh, and that was the key is there was, it was a conversation worth having. It was, a, to me, it was a little more difficult because I wasn't interested in blame. I was more interested in, you know, what happened? Why did it happen? What were the decisions? And he seemed to be a little more interested in the blame game. But uh, t t collectively, we did come away with, you know, some, uh, interaction that was worth having. Um, then come the allies. Let's start on the left. Uh, I don't remember the guy's name. Uh, it was an Aussie uh, engaged in conversation. And I've, I found him to be the most sane, right? He, this is a guy who actually um, saw, kind of sees both sides of, the, of it in terms of the perspective of decisions of who would who was making the decisions, what were the consequences. Um, it was, to him, it, it, that engagement seemed to be more about learning. And then comes the Brit. Um, wow. Th this, is, this is the guy that caused me to contemplate even doing a video in the first place. First of all, you can't engage with a couple of exchanges every 24 hours in any kind of meaningful conversation. And this guy's name, or call sign, or whatever, is John, uh, John Burns. And with due respect, he's borderline troll. Uh, lots and lots and lots of great quotes, right? Um, mostly it comes from uh, Ryland's book, 
Neil Ryland's book and um, uh, the U.S. Army Official History. Okay, almost almost all of his quotes came from there. That one of those two sources. And um, you know, Neilan Nyland has a has an agenda. Um, and the American Army, it's like it's a it's not done by an author, right? It's done by a a, a collective of uh, staff officers. And so it, it doesn't have the same kind of personalized one, you know, one one theme message kind of um, authorship. So it's a lot more like a collection of facts and reports and you know things of that nature. So um, it is a it is a narrative. It's a pretty decent document. I have read some of it. Obviously, I haven't read the whole thing, but um, but when you look at the the interaction between the two of us uh, that went on for a couple weeks. Um, literally, every single American you can imagine was in the blame game. Uh, we had the Americans had one hundred percent percent accountability, and with the uh, he does throw London under the bus. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, but otherwise. I could not detect a single acknowledgement of any wrongdoing or mistake or misjudgment or you know ill mal you know, malice or ill will uh, or incompetence or anything on the on the British side, right? It's it's so it was it was really interesting to see. You got the Yank who pr- pretty much blames the uh, the Brits. You got the Brit who absolutely blames the Americans, and then you got the Aussie who's kind of like. Yeah, well, this was an interesting point uh, that I learned, you know, and our conversation was actually pretty good. Now, I want to talk about the troll, right? The Brit, um, John Burns. Now, why do I call him a troll? I mean, that's kind of a harsh thing to say about somebody. But I, I'm going to throw this one up right off the bat. This was pretty late in the exchange um, when I started to shut it down. And Big Woody jumps in and throws in some commentary and John and he kind of get into a little, you know, exchange going back and forth. And you can see right off the bat, uh, Rambo. Um, and I think <laughs> big Woody calls, uh, um, Burns, uh, burning, burning boy or something like that. You know, you start getting into name calling and right off the bat, you, right off the bat, you know, it's not a, an exchange that's probably going to be overly productive. Okay, but this is important because uh, he's, if you look there at the top, the, the thing that sort of ends the discussion um, with John Burns is when I, I kind of point out, you know, I was starting to get this, I wasn't starting, there was a theme of America's guilty, America's guilty, America's guilty, Britain's innocent, oh, we're just a bunch of good soldiers, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and finally, I was just like, well, okay, you're, you know, your agenda's clear, you know, thanks, we're not going to have this conversation anymore. And he comes back with this holier than thou, you know, my agenda is facts. I'm like, well, that's a load of shit, okay, with due respect. Um, and, and this one was a, an exchange that was between him and Big Woody and not, and not me. Notice that he talks about Operation Market Garden and the U.S. 7th Armor that fails to seize you know, this, this particular town, what was the name? And, and he was basically, they were, he was insulting, uh, Big Woody over a series of things. And finally he comes up with the Battle of Overloon. And like, okay, now two things about the Battle of Overloon. Um, it was after Operation Market Garden. It was after the extraction of British Airborne from, from Arnhem. So, you know what who who cares what difference does this discussion this point have to do with operation market garden now he claims it was part of market garden and he claims that the 7th US armor failed to seize it okay so now let's take a look at over overloom where and where it is relative to the corridor uh, you know using google this the blue route there is the, the approximate path of uh, 30 core um Overloon has absolutely no bearing on the fight that was the key battle. Up in here, you have the, uh, up in here is uh, Nijmegen. There's Nijmegen. Here's the road bridge. Here's the railroad bridge. Uh, Grav is right here. Here's the water canal with the uh, human bridge and the three other 
bridges that were in their landing zone. And off to the east is, I think this is the area that they, that they were referring to as the Reichswald. Um, it's labeled in another graphic. And so this is the battle space that where the critical event occurs where uh, the 82nd Airborne is prioritizing defense against um, this imagined threat from the east over securing the bridges. Like, okay, so Overloon occurs after the battle and is, what, 50 miles away? Okay, facts mean nothing if they're irrelevant. If I walk out onto my porch and I look up and the sky is blue and there are no clouds and the temperature is pleasant and it's low humidity and I say the weather is wonderful, okay, that, that's fine. Now let's go down the street to down the road a mile to a farmer who steps out and he looks up at that same blue sky with no clouds and low humidity and moderate temperature. And then he looks down at the ground and sees his crops, which are dead because he's in the middle of a 10 year drought. Do you think that his context for those facts is the same as mine? Do you think that he looks up and sees that as wonderful weather or maybe a little bit of light rain would be uh, pretty good from his point of view? So facts are, are necessary. Uh, we, we need to have facts as a foundational, but context does matter. And this, you know, when you start to get on your high horse, um, you start to lose credibility. And so the rest of this video, I'm going to kind of talk about some of the, the uh, accusations that, you know, were undercutting my, my position, if you will, and how when you view things through this nationalistic lens, you don't get uh, a proper picture and you can't make, at least in my opinion, you can't make good judgments about uh, the battle and the leaders and the decision makers. So if I was to summarize John's um, grievances and sort of prioritize the top three or four, uh, this is this is the way I would summarize the two weeks of engagement. You know, basically, Americans are to blame for everything. Um, Americans withhold, withheld resources, and therefore it failed. Uh, Americans failed to secure the flanks, and America failed in their easy missions, where, of course, the British mission was the hard mission. Okay, so let's, uh, I've included these and highlighted in red the British and in blue the uh, the Americans to, to sort of give you a, a sense of some of his commentary. And when you look at this, if you want to stop and freeze the frame, you'll see there's some of this stuff is, there are some valid points in here, right? This is a guy who has the potential to engage in a meaningful conversation, but he skews everything, you know, in between every one of his quotes, he injects his opinion where he, where he takes that fact that he just presented and puts it in a context that it's like, okay, uh, this, this just doesn't work, okay? So I'm going to pluck a couple of these out here. Um, you can stop and watch, like I say, uh, review these others. And this is, again, to give you a sense of some of the, the interactions. So Monty is far less accountable than Eisenhower. Okay, now going back to my Army t-shirt. Whatever you want to say, um, Eisenhower has a higher more general overview of the activity. And, you know, I would get operations orders from higher that I didn't like. But when they, as, a, as an operations officer at the battalion level, the brigade would send me something I didn't like. Okay, but if I'm the execution headquarters, um, if I'm responsible, it does not matter whether I like the order or whether I think it's optimum or not, um, you don't become less accountable. The, the president of the United States and the prime minister, the buck stops there, right? They are responsible. But as you get closer and closer to the, the, the battle zone, the fact of the matter is accountability increases every step you go down that ladder because it's Major Cook who's crossing the, uh, the Wall River in the boats with his men, where the rubber meets the road, 
he is accountable with his life, right? It, you, you, it's just in the military, <laughs> that's the way it works. You can't say Monty is far less accountable. Okay, and then he throws in, well, he undersources the re, um, the resourcing in the, of this thing. And then he, you know, throws Brereton under the uh, under the bus and uh, Eisenhower was his bus. Oh, and Monty was the good professional soldier who always obeyed his orders. Now, for those of you who are not uh, Americans, you might not know the story about the point where General Eisenhower was getting upbraided by Montgomery uh, in in Europe. And he finally had to say, Monty, you can't talk to me like that. I'm your boss, right? Monty had the power to influence all the decisions that were affecting British forces. He was one of the top three commanders in the theater. Eisenhower was the supreme commander, Bradley was the American commander and uh, under Eisenhower, and Montgomery was the highest ranking um, British commander. To suggest that he was just along for the ride is just fundamentally, and had no say, and he just had to obey orders, uh, and that he always did, is just hogwash. Okay. Uh, going to drop down here. You notice that he, he throws London under the bus here a little bit, basically throwing Churchill under the bus um, and saying, well, they got what they wanted. We're going to talk about the strategic view in a minute. And yes, they did get what they wanted. It's like, okay, so this is fine. But it's almost like uh, when you read it in context of, of his other messages, it's almost like um, they're to blame because they got what they wanted. And I was like, well, yeah, they got what they wanted. They're, they're directing the war. Um, and it's our job as subordinates to make it happen. Um, okay, he throws it in Brereton and Williams again. Uh, and then now we start, I'm going to start talking about some of the uh, disparagement aspects of, of his commentary. You know, failure of an execution that two easy bridges were not seized by U.S. paras, but, you know, of course, everything that... Uh, um, everything that the British did was hard and everything that the Americans did was easy. And, you know, it only failed because of whatever. And then he throws in the narrative that it was 90% successful. It failed by a whisker and it was all 182nd, 101st fault. And like, well, first of all, uh, anyone who thinks that 90% of a fail, of a fail, this is a yes, no operation. You either get across the Rhine or you don't. Eventually, um, 30 Corps was going to advance to the Rhine River in a slow, methodical way that would have not necessarily been as risky. So this this whole 90% thing, let's face it, everyone knows Mark and Garden was a failure. And this you know British narrative that it was 90% successful is a load of crap. Okay. Oh, Hodges. Okay, who the hell is Hodges? Well, Hodges is the American general to the south. Bradley is to the south. And they're disobeying orders and stealing supplies and giving them to Patton. What? Now Patton is guilty. This is all Patton's fault. Um, you know, and, and then he goes on to say, okay, Hodges was spread out and he was giving supplies to Patton. Patton should have been fired. And yet, okay, remember, he he's basically says, uh, John Burns is saying at one point that the Americans failed to produce even a single division, right? He could not even, could not give even a division for Market Garden. Yet earlier, you remember I pointed back up to that, the irrelevant fact. Remember, the 7th Armor was somewhere up in Overloon. Now, we didn't do so good, apparently, at Overloon. Um, but in his own words, Operation Overloon, 7th Armor was part of Operation Market Garden, but we couldn't spare a division. So his, you know, his facts were inconsistent. Um, you know, and okay, so we're going along. All right, so in one of the commentary along the ways, I pointed out kind of uh, related to the good plan theory, good plan, bad plan theory, that I think that when you put 10,000 men on the far side of 3,000 foot span bridges and two other large uh, water barriers. I, I think that's not a good plan. Okay, There's, and maybe somewhere down the road we can have that conversation. Um, 
To which he replies, it was thought to be a good plan, blah, blah, blah. The road from Arnhem, from the Zahn, the Zahn River, basically um, Eindhoven to Arnhem, was devoid of troops. Non-combat troops in Nijmegen with no bridge defenses, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's funny. As I recall, the 9th and 10th Panzer were known to be in Arnhem from two distinctly different intelligence sources, the first being the RAF uh, reconnaissance uh, photo photographs, and from the Dutch underground. And it's like, okay, maybe you don't trust the Dutch, but you have your own photos, and you have two independent sources telling you that the 9th and 10th Panzer are there, and maybe they are degraded, but there are combat forces right in the midst of your plan. And oh, by the way, we're going to come back to the large armored force in the vicinity of the Reich Wall, uh, and the thousand tank myth, it's, it's not entirely clear if the thousand tanks were number was thrown around prior or if it was after, but there was an intelligence report of large tank formation in the Reichswald area. So this notion that the road was, uh, you know, basically open is hogwash. There were two divisions sitting on the objective and one on the flank. Uh, or I should say one large formation on the flank. A thousand tanks actually equates to two pre-war panzer divisions or, or thereabouts. And it probably was the equivalent of four uh, 1944 panzer divisions because they reorganized uh, to a binary system uh, part of the way through the war. So whether it's, the, the point is, there were a crap load of tanks that were known to be in and on the, the, the corridor. So here we go again. You start when you start throwing quote facts around that are not based in reality. You start to lose your credibility. And then the final straw, I think, is you know we start to get really personal. You know his his uncle Jimmy. Uh, I'm not sure who Uncle Jimmy was, but Uncle Jimmy had little respect for the 82nd Airborne, as many were running south away from Nijmegen, and um, uh, the you know as we come down here. The amphibious assault uh, performed by the 82nd uh, could, uh, was only a diversion. Its prime reason was to save Gavin's face. Like, okay, so now we're starting to <laughs> call into question, you know, the courage. Um, I I'm no Browning fan, but Browning was the guy who made the decision to allow Gavin to do this. He turned down the amphibious assault once. Uh, you're telling me that Browning was going to let... British Airborne die on the vine just to save Gavin's face. Um, you know, there comes a point at which you got to tell a troll, you know, go pound sand. And, and to be honest, it took till about this point to understand that he was a troll. I mean, let's face it. Uh, when you can't, when you, when you're talking about people's, um, you know, their, their motives, their professionalism, their competence, and you're you're calling them out as basically as cowards, which he he denied in, in, a, in a subsequent. I never said they were cowards. It's like, well, when you say uh, when you're talking about 82nd guys running away from the battle, um, you're not exactly implying that they're you know brave heroic men, right? So th th this was the stuff that as I went along, I started to feel going back to the. Uh, opening one of the opening slides there with Tick's um, frustration. You know, he, he needed a break because he, he deals with, as a full-time blogger or vlogger, whatever they call him now, um, every day he's got, you know, guys like this throwing lots of facts up on the boards, some of which are irrelevant, some of which are uh, not correct, and, some, and most of them which are simply out of context or, you know, don't, don't necessarily come to the right conclusions, if you will. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was starting to realize, oh my God, I could never be a full-time uh, video guy. Uh, so I have immense respect and more respect for Tick and for Lewis uh, and the guys who do this full-time than I ever did before. Okay, so now we're well into this and I'm going to kind of go through real quickly, um, you know, my counters to those four main arguments that he was making, that, that Americans are to blame, that, uh, um, you know, that the, the operations were easy, etc. If you look at uh, the, the command structure, 
Uh, simple fact is this is kind of how I break it down. Um, strategic level, you got Montgomery and Eisenhower. Operational level, you got uh, you know the, the Army and Corps commander types. And then that the rubber meets the road is uh, going to be the tactical. Now, that may not be perfectly doctrinally correct, but that's how I'm going to do it. And at the strategic level, you're talking about doing things like you're, you're evaluating the strategic concepts and plans and who's going to get priority. At operational level, you're starting to put the plans together and actually maybe execute them depending on what level it is. And then the tactical guys are the ones who are putting the plan, you know, rubber meets the road, putting the plan in play. And if you look at this, you'll notice the, in red the British guys and that are pertinent to the discussion and the blue are the Americans. Now, in the blame game, I, I personally think that it, it stops at this point right here. Yeah, we can blame Montgomery. Um, yeah, we can blame Bradley. And we can blame Eisenhower for different aspects of this. Um, I think the most culpable of the three would be Montgomery um, because it was in his sector. Uh, any way you slice it, uh, you know, trying to blame Patton, who's 300 miles away, for something that happens in your sector, uh, unless there's a very clear, distinct link, um, it just doesn't make sense. But with that said, I, I think personally I view the, the mistakes to occur more or less in the operational level, the key mistakes um, to be in the operational level and below. So if, if it were up to me, I would probably say, you know, the blame game starts at this point right here and down. Uh, so real quick. Strategic concept. Uh, if you need to stop this, you know, pause the video here, you can look at it. The concept was good. It's right. Like concentrate your forces, single axis of attendance, get across the Rhine, okay, turn to the north and and open up uh, the, sh the Scheldt estuary and get Antwerp in operation, turn to the south and get uh, to attack the Ruhr or go east to, the, to, to Berlin. The, it's the plan that was bad. So when, when people... When Tick says it was a good plan, I think what he really means is that it was, or sh or I think what he should mean is that conceptually the concept was in fact good. The plan was bad. Now we're not going to have a chance to discuss in gory detail here today uh, all the different aspects of the bad plan, but some of them, the battlefield geometry, landing the British airborne north of the Rhine, for example, puts them on the far side of three 1,000-foot spans, irreplaceable in the, in the time allotted, um, three irreplaceable spans. Um, you know, failures of intelligence, wishing, on the one hand, they wish away the 9th and 10th Panzer to make it justifiable to, to put British in on the north side. But then on the other hand, they embrace the large armor force on the Reichswald, which changes the whole operational activity for the 82nd Airborne to focus on flank security and deprioritizing the bridge, right? So, so on the one hand, we wish it away, and on the other hand, the force that's vague, we, we, we're, we're worried about. The force that's defined, we ignore, right? That done, there's lots of issues with the intelligence, but those are probably the two big ones. And then, you know, badly executed. Uh, the Nijmegen Bridge deprioritization. Of course, the Son Bridge and the Best Bridge were uh, defended, uh, and the Son Bridge was uh, actually destroyed. Um, this kind of gets into that easy thing, you know. The enemy gets a vote. Remember, they get to defend their bridges. They know we want those bridges. So the, this idea is um, crazy. Um, and then the last point I'm going to put here, and I want to be very clear about something. The British operation was an utter disaster, and the British never fully secured their bridge. And that has absolutely nothing to do with the heroic actions of, of Lieutenant Colonel Frost and his men. I personally consider uh, his um, their operations in Arnhem to be one of the the you know seminal moments or operations of British arms in World War II. What they did was amazing, okay? But it wasn't because uh, the plan north of the, of the Rhine River was any good. Uh, everything about the British operation was a failure, and they never secured both ends of the bridge. 
And we'll talk in a later video, if there's any engagement in, off of this video, we'll talk about the effects of um, securing the south end of the bridge and why that was would have been important uh, if, if 30 Corps had gotten there in time. Okay. 30 Corps was not slow. Um, they were delayed, but generally speaking, made up the first delay. Um, remember, the enemy gets about uh, Nijmegen was, the, of course, the major delay, and it has to do with that deprioritization, and I do think there is accountability for both uh, Gavin and um, Browning. Um, and the key on the, the Nijmegen Bridge is this is the one event, the one flaw that by itself could have changed the fate of the operation. The amount of delay that occurs at Nijmegen by itself puts 30 Corps at the south end of the Arnhem Bridge while John Frost's troops are still on the north end, giving them the best chance of success. So th that's the reason, um, you know, that I don't think that Americans, you know, Big Woody and those guys, I don't think we can dismiss uh, the significance of this decision and the American contribution to that decision, etc. So. This is the fatal flaw at the time of execution. Um, if we go back to the battlefield architecture and some other things, there are lots of things that go into getting us there. But once H hour happens, once we have boots on the ground, uh, this is the only decision that can be changed theoretically. If, if on the drop zone, uh, Gavin had gone over and told Lundquist, run for the bridge right now and, and got him and we had secured the bridge on day one, this one thing could have been changed. Uh, this one result could have been changed. And generally 30 Corps' progress, I think, you know, if you look at it, was good. Uh, there, the, the flaw that they're, that they're guilty of will be uh, in how they handle flank security. But they made timely progress uh, to Eindhoven after the initial delay right off the line where the you know, preliminary defenses were. Um, they pretty much made good their, their time up to Nijmegen once they got the Somme Bridge replaced. Uh, and the, the fact of the matter is, after Arnhem, the fact that they stopped for tea is irrelevant because three hours before that bridge was secured, um, Frost Bridge had surrendered. So it, 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 you know, we can make more out of it than it is, but unfortunately, it was irrelevant at that point. Um, so I'm going to address these real quick uh, in reverse order. I'm going to start with the easy thing, okay? But before we do that, we've got to talk about battlefield geometry and some terminology. Okay, so if we're talking about the way flank security is going to work, we're talking about this thing, you know, this is set up with here at the bottom is 2nd Army on the left, center, and right. You have the 12th, 30th, and 8th Corps. 30 Corps is going to be on the forward line of troops, and they're going to be departing the line of departure and moving to the limit of advance within their boundaries. Okay, so they have a set of boundaries that it's their territory. And this will go back to one of the discussions about flank security. Uh, and the operation for Arnhem occurs inside of their boundaries. Remember, the limit of advance is actually beyond Arnhem. The intent is to get over the bridge. And that's where they would basically come to a pause, secure the bridgehead, and then make the decision of which way to go. So the idea is to push down the road, drop in the airborne, and once you get across, you make the decision to go up to the Zuter Z and secure the Schwelt estuary, go to the Ruhr to the south, or proceed on to the east. So this is sort of the orientation. And if you look off here on the right side, there's an entire corps, the 8th British Corps, on the right flank of the 30 Corps, and then the U.S. Army, uh, 1st Army, is off to the right of that. And then way, 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 way over there is U.S. 3rd Army, which is under Patton, okay? And if you lay it out on the map, you can see right here, right in this upper northeast corner is the, the jump-off point for 30 Corps. Over here is the British. Here, here you have 2nd um, Army under Dempsey. Down here, starting about Maastricht down toward Luxembourg, is the 1st Army under Hodges. Okay, and then the route of advance is up this road. 
Now, one of the problems with all these maps, these come out of Cornelius Ryan's. Uh, they're about as good as anything I found. One of the problems we have in any of these discussions is that maps just suck. Uh, they don't have the right detail. And if you take a look, I've tried to summarize as best I can what the requirements were. Okay, and the fact of the matter is there were basically eight bridges, including three 1,000-foot span bridges along the way. The ones marked here in blue are alternate bridges. You know, they, they could have sufficed. Um, the 82nd tried to take, um, sorry, the 101st tried to take uh, Best and San. And so let's, you know, when we talk about those easy missions, British Airborne had an entire division, not, not all on day one, but they had an entire division to secure one of two bridges. They secured one half of one bridge. The 101st, down here at the bottom, had to secure a minimum of four bridges, and two of those were defended by 88 millimeter guns. Now that's the main gun from a tank, uh, the uh, Tiger tank. Okay, they had to secure four bridges. Here on the Domel, there was actually three, uh, four opportunities to cross the Domel. I've only highlighted one. Uh, and they had to get the Willems Canal, the Awe River, and the Domel and the Wilhelmina. Okay, so this is the one that gets blown and in the movie, you know, they have to rebuild the Bailey Bridge, right? So this one causes them an eight to 12 hour delay. But once they get over that, these other bridges are secured adequately that the race up the road and across the Rhine is pretty fast and 30 core makes good. So this whole myth that they 30 core was slow is, you know, I, I don't think so. There was a delay when they arrived at Nijmegen, they were behind schedule, but not by much. You know, we're talking a few hours, um, depending on how you look at it. But of all the operations, of all the airborne divisions, if we look here in the uh, Nijmegen, the Grav to Nijmegen region, the 82nd Airborne had to secure a minimum of three bridges. And in reality, these three, the string of three bridges right here are all in the middle of their drop zone. So the reality is they had to secure a minimum of one, two, this is the Human Bridge or Hoyman Bridge. Um, this was the main one. The idea was to come up, cross the Grav, turn to the right, cross over, and then approach the road bridge from here. But they had to secure three bridges, including two of the three thousand foot spans, and defend against this alleged threat from the east, this large armored force, which later we hear about the, the thousand tank myth uh, that, that evolves at some point. That's not easy, okay? None of these operations, this was not easy. The, Ar the British operation at Arnhem was not easy. The, the American operation here in the 101st was not easy. And when you start to disparage uh, the, the nature of the mission so that you can justify your, your agenda that the Americans are to blame for everything, it's like, yep, yeah, okay. I, in, in the most simplistic way, yes, the San Bridge, the Americans failed to get that bridge as if the enemy doesn't get a vote. And this decision right here turns out to be the crucial one. Why didn't, you know, why didn't they secure this bridge on day one? Okay, and that's the one that probably has the most legitimate um, rationale behind it. And personally, it's the one that I, I actually tend to agree with. Now, if you look at this, uh, I mentioned there's, you know, maps are, the problem with maps is they all suck. Uh, this is, uh, this map right here shows you where they are at the end of the 26th. And I hope I don't get censored by uh, uh, YouTube, but um, you know, this is, uh, this is a, um, the, the road right here. Now, if you notice here, um, this little town right here, okay, that's, I, my little circle got moved. That's right here, okay? In this map, it wasn't even in the secured uh, zone of the Allies. So, um, when we talk about easy missions, there is no easy mission on this, and th that's just ridiculous. Uh, and this does lead us to one of the points that I make. Remember those boundaries we talked about in the battle? You notice here, 30 core. Here's 12th core boundary. Here's 30 core. Here's 30 core, and here's 8 core. 30 core had a very narrow corridor, 
Flank security belonged to 8th Corps and 12th Corps. And when I talk about flank security, I'm talking about operational, you know, flank security. But in a later conversation, if anyone's interested, we need to talk about flank security within the corridor because it's important. And this is one of the things that 30 Corps didn't do uh, correctly, at least not in my opinion. So I'm going to start off with the view that this disparaging and trying to make your case on the basis of uh, Americans failing in their easy missions is horseshit. Um, now, if we overlay those same two maps here, um, you can see here, let's talk about flank security. So one of his major arguments is that the Americans failed in flank security. Well, there's, there's s several levels of flank security. First of all, there's the flank security within the corridor itself. And we'll talk about that next. Uh, the 30 core um, security along the corridor. Then there's the flank security of the corridor, provided on the left by the 12th and on the right by the 8th British Corps. And then there's what you would call operational security, which is further, uh, uh, further afield. So if this is the um, approximate... Uh, corridor. Let's take a look at where First Army's obligations would have been. First Army's boundary with the British was right about in here. So their attack would have been down here and it would have been squeezed between the, the West Wall, the Siegfried Line. And remember, this is supposed to be 8th Corps right in this area right here. Okay. So regardless of what American failures might have occurred on flanking activities. Um, the the decision point is up here. It's 50 or more miles of, away from anywhere that the Americans might have been operating. Remember, Overloon, I think, is like right about in this little spot right here. At some point after the operation, Briti or the 7th Armor gets up into this Overloon area, and that's about 50 miles and if you look from Nijmegen to where the jump off points of um, the first army would have been, it's a hundred miles. So the, the, the argument that the United States failed in its duties to provide flank support is absolutely utter horseshit. Okay. And you can see, you just got the little span there that shows the distance to Nijmegen. Okay, so this is the thing that I'm talking about in terms of if there is a flaw in flank security, it was the tactical level security that was the real issue. So imagine the 30 Corps is moving along the road, and as they go along, one of the things that should have happened is forces from 30 Corps should have been branching off to set up blocking positions as they go along. Okay, and if this is really an armored force, it's going to take armor to stop armor, okay? Uh, the 82nd Airborne is not capable of doing two major bridges, four subordinate bridges, and provide secure, securing this, the town of Nijmegen and providing security against a large armor force. Uh, so the, the failure to build into the plan a, you know, an echelon uh, peeling off to the right, if you will, uh, at the critical stages. Remember, this was in British intelligence. They said this was here. So the fact that 30 Corps didn't, as soon as uh, Vandalier's guys, you know, the Grenadier Guards got across the road here, the very next organization behind him should have been an armor unit that peeled, or any tank unit that would peel off to the right and set up blocking positions and reinforce, uh, you know, the positions of the airborne that were there. So if there was an issue in flank security, it was at the tactical level, not at the operational level. It wasn't the first army that was to blame. Maybe the 80, uh, the Eighth Corps could have provided, but by nature, remember an airborne operation with a salient, the flanking uh, forces of the 12th and the 8th are not expected to keep up with them. They, they've got to cross the same water obstacles and they don't have the airborne to do it. So even within the second army, it's, absolutely ridiculous to think that the 8th Corps could have provided flank security at the Reichswald area in vicinity of Nijmegen. 
That was a responsibility of 30 core. And if there was a mistake in 30 cores operation, that was it. Okay, one of the next arguments he makes is diverting of resources. Uh, this is horseshit. Uh, once again, it's all we got to call it what it is. There are no uh, reported reports of significant um, stoppages by 30 core inside the corridor due to the lack of food, fuel, or ammo. You could probably find an example where a tank or a platoon of tanks ran out of gas or ran out of something. But that is almost um, certainly a limitation of the main supply route for this operation was a single road. There's no, uh, there is no reported example. The, the delays that occurred for 30 core were delays at the Son Bridge and at the Nijmegen Bridge and fighting in, in Nijmegen to get to the Nijmegen Bridge and secure it. So there is, and, and of course they were waiting, remember we all know the scene where they're bringing the boats up to do the amphibious assault. The whole Nijmegen delay was not a logistical delay. It wasn't, it, it doesn't matter what Hodges sent to who. It doesn't matter what resources the Americans shuffled around internally for themselves. If Operation Market Garden had been successful and First Army had then been unable to advance uh, the set, that 7th Armored, for example, up along the flanks toward Overland, if they had been failed to provide operational support going forward of a successful operation and or Dempsey had been deprived of resources so that once he got across the bridge he was stuck because he was because he had no gas and no bullets then the case for uh, diversion of resources to Patton's third army might have had some merit but in the absence of the success of that operation inside of the context of operation market garden and 30 core there was no diversion by Hodges and Bradley to down to Patton that had any impact on the operational success or failure of Operation Market Garden. So if we come back to the beginning and wrap it up, um, I want to compliment Lewis on the work that he did with this uh, particular series. It's a lot of good work. Uh, and he does make some interesting observations uh, and assessments that I think are um, not normal. Uh, I think too many people do buy into the uh, Cornelius Ryan, uh, Ryan version of events. Um, and as a consequence, you know, there's a lot of Monty blaming and things like that. Um, he's right, you know, Tick is right. Lewis is right. There is a degree of culpability. Um, but as I said before, there's also uh, the matter of context. You know, and for that, I'll come back to my general narratives. And for those who are, are you know, have come to this and actually sat here and watched this uh, discussion now, uh, thank you for your patience. Um, what I would like to see is engagement in discussions about um, the plan. You know, was it good? Was it bad? And, and remember... Americans were big contributors to this plan, right? So um, Brereton and Williams were part of the plan, uh, making of the plan. So if it's a bad plan, it doesn't mean that it's all Monty's fault, right? Um, it doesn't mean that it's all um, Browning's fault. It would be curious to have discussions that are, that are not so skewed by nationalistic uh, agenda to see what decisions were made by Brereton, what, what decisions were made by... Um, Williams and Horrocks and Browning, etc. And did they, uh, were there things that could have been and should have been done that were known at the time, right? The, the second, second guessing them after the fact is not what we're talking about. Some of these decisions they knew at the time when they, when they choose whether to land at Oosterbeek or whether they land at Drill, they had those two choices at the time. Were their decisions good, bad, or indifferent? Um, was the architecture of that battle any good or not? 
And I'd love to have those kinds of discussions and maybe make a more detailed video uh, on some of the specific pieces of parts. You know, does, any, do, does anyone agree or disagree on the slow thing? I think 30 core, you know, what were the things um, that caused them to be late? Uh, was it their fault? Was there, you know, incompetencies? Um, were there things they could have done to improve the operation that they could have known and should have known at the time or did know at the time? For example, the, the threat of the tanks in the Reichswald. Um, you know, with Gavin, it's, it's more or less, okay, the only question would come down to is could the operation probably have been architected slightly differently to where the bridges were the priority and he would have gone to the bridges first and he wouldn't have been quite as worried about his, his security, his flank security. Um, you know, these are the kinds of discussions I would like to have. And uh, for those of you, again, who are new to my channel, uh, this is my first uh, go at it. And uh, I apologize, it's a little bit lengthy. Um, I've got to work on, uh, you know, efficiency here as I go forward. But um, I would love to have your feedback and if you have different thoughts and opinions, uh, that's great. Um, but if you're going to be a troll, you know, if you're just going <laughs> to, uh, if, you, if you're going to come with an agenda, you know, go somewhere else. Um, but if you want to come for a discussion, then let's have that discussion. And then at the end of those discussions, we can, we can play the blame game. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but let's learn about this battle. It's an important battle. It's one of the most significant coalition activities of the war. I mean, obviously, things like D-Day, the major invasions, right? And this is right up there with them. Um, and let's try and learn how to uh, benefit from these mistakes because we live in a world that is dangerous and we need to stop being you know uh, for what is it you know what is it four countries uh, by separated by the common language whether you're Canadian or American or New Zealand and and we, we have our our other friends in Europe and Asia um, it's important for us in my view to have meaningful dialogue, learn the lessons that can be learned, um, and make our alliances better, and make our relations between our countries and our peoples better. I think this is way underestimated in the in the current affairs. In uh, in recent years, you know, America has been uh, well, not just America, the, you know, the, these nationalistic America firsters and they're all over the world. It's, you know, the reality is we live in an inter, um, interconnected world and we are dependent on each other. Um, not one country in Europe is big enough to do it alone and America's big enough to do it alone, but we're not in Europe. You know, we got to ship everything across the ocean. So whether we like it or not, we are part of coalitions and we need to understand how those things work. So please, uh, you know, join in the conversation. Leave your comments, and uh, let's see if we can uh, learn more about this operation and learn from each other and engage in some type of meaningful dialogue uh, without all the nationalistic crap. All right, have a good evening. Thanks for watching.